great. Good morning. Hi, welcome to session 2.1J, Explicit Instruction Using Enhanced Core Reading Instruction. My name is Kirsten DeRoche. I'm a patent consultant at Patent East. I'm very excited to facilitate this session for everyone. I've heard this group do some stuff already and I'm looking forward to more. A few housekeeping items before the session starts. Any, um, we're working on getting a link added to the Patent Symp Literacy Symposium um, Schoology for today. There will be a link there that you are um, under June 11th in order to um, request access to videos that the school team will share. This session will be 75 minutes long. The session is being recorded. The chat feature will be off between participants, but you'll be able to chat with me if you have any needs. Also, if you have any questions for the for the presenters, please feel free to enter those into the chat as well. Please keep your video feature off and mute yourself to eliminate any potential distractions to the presentation. We would love for you to tweet out or share on social media all that you're learning from the Literacy Symposium. The hashtag to do that is patent or hashtag PA Literacy Lit Symposium. Oh man, I'm gonna redo that. Hashtag PA lit symposium 2020 and now i'd like to introduce you to the team from easterly parkway elementary school welcome guys hi everybody thank you so much for joining us today uh, my name is jonathan klingerman i am the director of gifted learning enrichment and title services for the state college area school district and i'm really really proud to be here with three really uh, amazing ladies um, today, you're going to be hearing from the principal of Easterly Parkway, Danielle Yoder. You're going to be hearing from one of our first grade teachers, Jamie Ramey, and one of our Title I reading specialists, Lori Corman. Uh, to begin with, we just want to first say that this has been a really exciting journey for us, and we're really excited to share what we've been doing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the entire journey, but also mention about how we have been transitioning our um, presentation of uh, lessons uh, of using ECRI's um, experiences into a virtual setting. And uh, what we really hope to do is to talk for a little bit, but then we really wanna open up to questions to be able to help support that type of, type of discussion. So uh, first off, we see a lot of our fellow State College people in here and it's really good to see all of you. So thanks for helping to join us as well. So we're gonna actually begin today with a video that we put together to kind of uh, bring a little bit of summary uh, to what we're gonna talk about. And then we will be able to jump into talking about the whole meat and potatoes. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. Maybe. All right, can everyone see my screen? Do I got a thumbs up? Good, okay. School. It's located in the State College Area School District and is in Center County, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit about our background with uh, reading and, and success, and I'm going to start by sharing a little bit of background about Easterly Parkway. Easterly Parkway is one of eight elementary schools in the State College Area School District. Uh, each year we have between about 310 and 350 students who come to us and they enter grades kindergarten through fifth grade. We have about 35% of our students who receive free and reduced lunch, and 29% receive ESL services. Uh, our school receives a lot of students who come from international families that attend Penn State University for grad programs. And in recent years, we have had a um, significant increase in our Guatemalan families who also attend Easterly Parkway. We are very diverse. We have an international feel and um, we pride ourselves on being inclusive. 
little bit about our background with reading and um, MTSS. So in the past years, we have used really a workshop approach. We teach according to our curriculum guidelines and teachers have different resources that they can use. Uh, what I found, I began in 2018, soon after arriving is there was very little phonemic awareness um, or phonics that was explicitly taught or um, used as part of the daily instruction in kindergarten through second grade. So in 2018-19, our kindergarten and first and even, uh, even second grade agreed to try out some Hagerty phonemic awareness and began to see results with our students. One thing I didn't share about Easterly Parkway is of the eight schools in the State College school system, we have been known as the lowest performing. Um, a lot of times we share that is because we have the influx of, you know, 29% of our staff or students, excuse me, come from uh, ESL backgrounds. But we decided that we can no longer use that excuse and we want all students to be able to grow. Um, we just weren't sure of what tools to use. So as I stated, we used phonemic awareness in 2018-19 and we applied for Patan's um, Enhanced Early Literacy Outcomes uh, grant that they were offering as part of the MTSS uh, series and we were accepted. So in the fall, we embraced on this journey uh, to find out a little bit more about the approaches for this series, more specifically the ECRI approach to reading. Um, I am going to have a title teacher today talk as well as one of our first grade teachers to really share the successes and how they jumped into that. But it really has been a shift in culture and for me uh, personally, it, it is changing our practice. Not only is it changing our practices of instruction and engaging our kids, but the engagement um, that we are seeing and the engagement opportunities in our kids is nothing like I've ever seen in the 28 years of teaching. So I am thrilled to have teachers present to you today um, and then follow up with answering any questions um, regarding our ECRI approach. Hello, my name's Laurie Corman and I'm one of the title teachers at Easterly Parkway Elementary School. Hi there, my name is Jamie Ramey. I'm one of the first grade teachers at Easterly Parkway Elementary with Katie Housel and Maria Neatley. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about our journey this year. So our team started as a brand new team. I'd been at Easterly for a few years. Katie had been at Easterly for a few years, but she had moved from fourth grade down to first grade this past school year. And Maria Neely came to us from Brooklyn, New York this year. So we were a new team getting to know each other, learning each other's styles and personalities, building trust. journey really began in October when we went for a training. So four days of us with our huge team. Our team was large because of the makeup of our school. So it included our principal, our director of curriculum, our third, three first grade teachers, the learning support teacher, the ESL teacher, the psychologist, the IST teacher, the coach, and myself. Um, we met every Wednesday for our PLCs to discuss how we were gonna move forward, how it was gonna look. Um, sometimes we would invite our IU consultant, Heather Spots, to come and help us at the beginning. She was there all the time helping us out and making sure that we were doing the routines correctly and with fidelity. Um, and I think one of the biggest things for us was collaboration, support, conversation. And this is just a theme that keeps coming up when I reflect on our journey as a team. We were regularly having conversations with each other and asking, did you run into this? What did you do when you said this? And we were able to have those conversations with each other. And if we didn't know the answer, we had support that we were able to get the answers from. 
but we also had this team support at our school. We had our title teachers, we had our principal, we had our uh, director of federal, federal programs stopping in to see the lessons and to see if we needed anything. So we had this cohesive team with this end goal of all students benefiting and when our focus is the kids, it really takes a lot of the other layers away. The two biggest, pow most powerful things for my tier two kids have been the pre-teach and the routines. We fiddled with our schedules enough that we could get the pre-teach in before the classroom teacher does her teaching. So my title students receive a pre-teach of the same exact lesson that they're going to get before they get it with the classroom teacher. And we have found that they really are able to participate a lot more during the classroom teacher's lesson. And they also feel more confident about what they know because they've already been through the lesson once. Which really did support that we did it as a pre-teach instead of a review. The other thing are the routines. I find my kids feel really successful with knowing and learning the knowledge that I'm trying to give them because they know the routines already. There's no guessing on how our day is gonna go for our 30 minutes in my room. We do the same exact routines every day and the kids really like it. I thought at first they might be a real, little reluctant or get bored, but I think because they are confident in knowing what's going to happen, the learning then just comes much more easy, to, more easily to them. Um, we found a lot of good success with the program for tier, my tier two students. This is the first year that I can say all my first graders can blend predictable words um, or regular words that follow the rules. And they also have found such success with the decodable text. They really like to read it more than once. Some of the behaviors that I used to get, I just don't find that I get this year because students are more successful with the program and with being able to read and they feel like they are readers. So it's really been a great addition to my teaching and um, to helping my students become better readers. One of our big concerns as we moved online is how are we going to continue delivering this instruction for our students because we have seen so much growth so far. We did not want to see our kids just stop. So as a team with, again, a lot of collaboration, support, conversations, and a lot of trial and error, we have been providing our lessons uh, over video. So we've been recording the lessons ourselves as teachers which are then posted to a website securely that our students have access to that they are able to do independently. And the way that we've kind of worked with that is with ECRI, one of the important pieces is that the students are participating and that if they are not saying the correct word, there is a correction piece. And if they don't know the word, they have other students around them that are providing the correct response so that they're exposed to it. So the way that we've done that is as the teacher, we are having the student read, so when we go through our routine today, we're gonna to practice reading words. When I point to the word, say the word in your head. When I slide my finger, read the word out loud, and then listen to see if what you say matches what I say. So we point, we slide, we allow that time for a student to respond, and then we say the word out loud. This takes slightly more time, but the students are then able to be exposed to the words if they're not reading accurately. And if they're inaccurate, they're getting that immediate response and feedback, which is crucial for them in their development and reading. Hi friends, it's Mrs. Rainey. We are going to get started with Unit 5, Lesson 23, Day 1. You are going to learn to read some new words using say it, spell it, say it. My turn word again. Your turn word. Spell again. Word. My turn word. Boy. Your turn word, spell boy, word, 
there. Great job, friends. Let's do some individual turns. When I point to a word, say the word in your head. When I slide my finger, read that word out loud and listen to see if the word you say matches what I say. Word. Along. Great job. Word. Together. Fantastic. Keep it up. Word. Father. Awesome, friends. Let's get to the sound spelling cards. You're going to practice the sound spelling cards. When I tap the cards, you'll tell me the name of the card, the sound, and the spelling. Card, book, sound, o, uh, spelling, o, o. Card, bird, sound, er, first spelling, e, r. Second spelling, i, r. Third spelling, you are. If you need another moment, go ahead and press pause. If not, we're going to get started with the word good. G, uh, g. My G is going to start just like that letter A. Just below that line, we're going to go up and around, up, way down, up, an underwater letter. And then I have my O, O pattern. Up and around, up and around. G, uh, d. You know where to start it? Yeah, all of our letters today started in that same place. We went up and around, up, way down, up, up and around, up and around, up and around, way up and down. Oh my goodness, all of those letters started in the same place. I want you to check and make sure that you spelled your word good. G-O-O-D. I want you to check and make sure they are all lowercase and that your D is up and around, way up and down and facing the correct direction. Okay, so I'm going to teach you how to write jar from lesson, from week three, lesson 21, learned by Miss, learned from Mrs. Housel. Okay, so word jar. Word, word is jar. Word jar. Oh, uh, what is it? Yesterday, I opened a jar of Nutella to make a peanut butter and Nutella sandwich. Word, jar. Say the sounds in jar, j, r. Say the sounds in jar with me again, j, r. Write the word jar. J. A R. Okay, I'm gonna check my word. J A R. Right word. Okay, so I got the word right, got everything right. Okay, bye. Thank you for watching. I didn't actually listen. We continue to have conversations about how things are going. We're moving to looking how we can support students in small groups with some of those interventions in an online environment on Zoom. So Laurie Corman and Maria Neely are doing small groups with our tier three students doing kindergarten equity uh, to meet with them. And again, it's still a work in progress, but that's what we figured out so far to try and meet the needs of our students. ECRI has given us the opportunity to have a program that has been rigorously tested and is evidence-based that we have our next steps in place. We know we are giving all of our students this amazing tier one instruction. And if students are not making progress, it is not because I did something wrong. It is because we need to give them more support. And we have very structured supports that are consistent across our grade level and consistent across our team that's working with our students. Since there is consistency across all of us, the first grade teachers, the title teachers, the ESL teachers, the special education teachers, 
we are able to flexibly group because there's no change, there's no shift that these students have to make. This is a routine that they are familiar with, that as long as they know that routine that we have all set up consistently, they are able to be successful in this program. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for allowing us to uh, share that uh, that video, which is a great summary. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple things, and then I'm going to pass the uh, microphone off to the the team at Easterly, who's living and breathing this every day. <clears throat> um, as Kristen had said at the beginning, um, all of the videos that have been prepared for our um, virtual ECRI experience um, are available for you to see for a time period. I know Kristen's going to place that in the um, Schoology link. It's uh, just a quick Google form to get your information and then I'll add your stuff to our Google um, Drive so that you can take a look at those videos um, if uh, you need more to, to reflect on. <clears throat> And then also something, uh, Jamie, maybe you can also speak to in a little bit, um, is that we are um, trying to um, implement and incorporate the ECRI piece in our summer um, reading intervention program. So um, for several years, we've had an in-person summer camp, and this year we're moving it virtual, and our reading specialists are working one-on-one um, -on -one and with small groups with students, and um, we're trying to continue that same exact experience with the um, the kiddos who have been receiving um, ECRI at Easterly. So at this point, um, I'm just going to pass things off to Danielle. I'll let you kind of see if there's anything you need to say, and then uh, we'll kind of go through some other things and then take questions from you all. Danielle? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. So I just, I, I think it's important to share one, a little bit of background, uh, a, a little bit more about Easterly Parkway. Jamie in that video talked a lot about how we have all come together to match resources and act as one. Um, and prior to really even this year, um, we didn't have PBI and S in place. We didn't have a lot of things in place. And they were often perceived as, Lori Corman was often perceived as, they are your kids. And we truly had teachers that wanted to give any child that was not at proficiency level to Title I or Special Ed. And to go in and, and really go to ESL since that population is ESL should just take for half the day was kind of the, the mindset of different staff. And I don't think, I think it was a, a not knowing um, but we really had to change that mindset of they're not their kids, they're our kids. And um, when we talked about what, what team and decided that first grade would really be the ones to embrace that and um, brought the large team, as Lori talked about, together, that was critical. Um, I, I will say, if you have opportunities down the road to be of any part of um, like a, a Patan uh, initiative, really push um, as an administration um, background, really push for the broader team because that is what brought us together by having those people listen and practice over and over. And then those weekly meetings, trying to bring everybody together. And um, we didn't get to where we wanted and then March hit, but uh, we really were able to begin to come together that people began to see that anybody could teach an intervention and previewing was more important than reviewing. Um, and just everybody receiving that structure. It didn't matter if they were reading, you know, at a third grade level. Um, what Jamie and, and even Lori will begin to tell you is their writing was increasing like we had never seen before and correct spelling and correct um, grammar within their writing. So it was a win-win um, with, you know, really came down to 30 minutes a day. We still were able to do a workshop approach in reading and a workshop approach in writing. And they'll talk to you about that a little bit, but um, I hope you ask a lot of questions and I'll let Jamie and Lori take it away. Hi there, my name is Jamie Ramey. I'm one of the first grade teachers. We have a team of three of us at Easterly Parkway that went along with, like we talked about, the greater team um, to do the training in ECRI practices. So we came back from our ECRI training and if you met our team, you would know we are gung-ho. So we were ready to go. We had a meeting where we got to plan and kind of figure out our plan of attack of how we were going to start implementing our ECRI practices in the classroom and decided to do kind of a slow rollout 
to make sure everyone was comfortable with the routines. Um, as we started, we really started to feel the power of what we were teaching the students in those routines. Uh, we were aligned with our title support. So Laurie Corman is gonna pop on in just a second and she can talk a little bit about how we aligned from our tier one in the classroom with our tier two and tier three with her. So I'll let you pop on real quick, Laurie. Um, ECRI kind of provided me with what I'd been searching for for a long time because we can truly support the classroom teacher and exactly what they're teaching our students. And so I just found it really powerful. Um, when we finally figured out that the preview was a little bit, was a lot better actually than, because we were reviewing at one point or previewing the day before and I wasn't sure my kids were really gonna be able to transfer that to the next day. So once we rerouted our schedule, um, and we started doing the true preview before they got the lesson. It just became so powerful and you could just see the kids begin to really retain all the teaching we were giving them. And that's why it was so important for us when March came <laughs> that we continue it because we were like just at that sweet spot. And when you start to think about the tier two and tier three kids having that summer loss and then an additional three months, four months, it just started to panic us all a little bit because we had come so far. Okay, I'm gonna stop my video so I can share my screen and sometimes stopping my video helps a little bit with that. But just to give you guys a little bit of um, just some data, which is something I feel like since working with ECRI, I am much more comfortable with data. Um, as we've gotten a lot of practice looking at it and looking at it in different ways than I've been used to. So when I say we had this huge team, like this is our team that we brought with us. And it was not only a great experience for all of us to have this exposure and this training, but it was great for us as people to really be in this experience together. Um, so when we came back, let me just see if my, there we go. Uh, you heard a little bit about our school and how diverse it is. And I will say I am very guilty myself of even the previous year talking about the students that we had and why they were not making progress. But this takes away they are not making progress because they are English language learners. What we found is that we can teach our English language learners how to read and also in their ESL services, they can be working on the reading, but also the vocabulary, which is so important that goes along with this. So ECRI has been really wonderful for us to, again, align our services, but also close those gaps. When we talk about that robust tier one instruction, we are delivering that robust tier one instruction, but then we are filling the gaps along the way with our tier two and tier three services so that they are still getting the grade level expectation while filling in the gaps. One of the other unique parts of our population is the student mobility. So each year we have some wild cards. Um, that are coming to us either international population or we have students that are just, um, we have a, the women's shelter which comes to us. So we have students that are homeless, that have um, high emotional needs that come to our school each year. Um, and our student population kind of cycles through. We'll have some students for a year or two and then they will leave. So, Here's the proof in the pudding. So as we are doing this, we're like following the course and we're trying really hard to make sure that we are doing what we can in the tier one, the tier two, the tier three. And um, we were worried. And I, and I can speak for myself. I was worried that we were not doing enough or we weren't gonna show the progress. And this is our tier transition from our beginning of the year to the winter. So one of the things that um, at the beginning of the year when we did our, uh, our screeners, 50% of our students qualified for Title I reading support. 
And that is not something we are able to deliver. As amazing as our title teachers are, we did not have enough manpower to be delivering that Title I reading support. Um, and Lari, I don't know if you want to hop in a little bit and talk about this as well. Um, just trying to figure out the technology here. Uh, yeah, so we, when we looked at our fall data, it was, we were so anxious to actually begin the ECRI journey because looking at our fall data, we were like, we have to do something. And what we've been doing up until this point just hasn't been getting enough kids to benchmark um, when you think that at least 80% should be there. And so we, we were super anxious to kind of start the ECRI program training to begin with because we knew we had um, students that were just not where they needed to be at, at this point in the year. And so then as you can see in the winter, um, there was a lot of movement. And that's why we were so disappointed that we couldn't end the year because we really just had started full ECRI with decodables like December sometime. Um, and so this was us starting our ECRI journey late October, just starting getting every, all the um, routines in line and place by maybe right before Christmas time. And so we knew with that little bit, we had gotten this far and we were anxious to see where it would take us by the end of the year. Jamie, if I could say something as well, looking at this graph, one of the things we want you to know is Lori and Danielle did not take 50% of our kids. We really talked a lot about MTSS this year and tier one within that tier one, how could we build the tier twos so that title one could focus and our first grade teachers, when the kids would come in um, with their breakfast and, and we, Again, um, we are blessed in a district that, uh, that allows us to do a lot of things. So the kids bring their breakfast, they don't sit in the cafeteria, they grab and go, they come down, they can check in. And we were able to do additional previews or even um, you know, hits within the classroom so that Title could really focus on the highest needs students. Um, and even though they were working with them, they may come back to the class and Jamie in her class would do another additional hit when they had time. So um, we, we realized in the winter, we had some kids that probably should have benchmarked in September, but just with some of those consistent um, systematic processes, those kids went from tier three to tier one in a matter of months once we really got the system down. And, and I think that is key. Danielle, thank you for that. Because I think that's one of the things that when we talk about they really became all of our students is we did really look at how we could do a tier two light within the classroom, but we also shared students. So if Maria Neely, one of our first grade teachers was able to pull a small group with students from both her class, my class and Katie Housel's class would pull a group together. I was able to pull a group of those tier two light kids, those like bubble kids, we might call them, that they could come and do that. I also had a student that came mid-year that was a struggling reader, and she went with our ESL students to get extra support because she was working on some of the same skills that our ESL students were working on with ECRI practices to fill those gaps. So she was still getting that tier one, she was getting tier two with Laurie Corman, but she was able to get a tier three intervention with ESL teachers because we were all trained on the same program, that it really was our students. Um, I'm gonna kind of fly through these because I do wanna get to another piece of what um, Danielle had mentioned. So this is our word reading fluency data that just shows from fall to winter. And Laurie, I'm so glad you mentioned it again, like we started in October. So the other piece is that this was not in place when we started school in August. We started late and we were catching up, but the program is so powerful that we were really seeing these gains. Um, as we move, 
This one kind of baffled us a little bit um, that their nonsense word fluency dropped a little bit, but I'm going to continue on right here that their oral reading fluency. So when you look again at just how many students we were expected to have in that high risk of that tier three category has really reduced, um, which is awesome to see. What I wanted to show you is some of this class by class data because this is something that I think as teachers, we've really shifted how we are looking at our data for our students. And as a teacher and a mother, this is something that was interesting for me, like, I wonder what my daughter's SGP is. So if you look, we have cut off the student names, but this is their fall percentile where they started, their tiers, then their winter percentile, and then that fall to winter SGP, that um, student growth percentile. So this is something that we were looking at um, to make sure that we are meeting the needs of the students and that we do not need to increase the intensity or frequency of interventions for our students. So for instance, first, first student on the list, second percentile in the fall, 36th percentile in the winter, jumped up two tiers. So they went from a tier three student to a tier one student, but their student growth percentile is a 95%. So that means compared to 95% of students across the nation that were in the second percentile, that student grew more than 95% of them. This was a really great way for us to see not only students who were in that tier three or tier two that we needed to intensify, but it helped us to see what students were responding to the interventions well, but also students that were in that tier one or tier two that might be at risk because their SGP is not 50% or higher, that we did need to put something else in place or look at them a little more closely so that we could make sure they, that they did not fall from that tier one into tier two or tier three. I'm gonna pull up my class's data just because I'm a, a little bit more familiar with this and I wanted to point out a couple of things. So like I was talking about that, um, watching to make sure a student does not fall from that tier one to tier two or tier three. I had a student that came to me and when we brought our data uh, to Patton for our presentation, Jen Collins had pointed out, I want you to look at this student because her SGP is lower and we wanna make sure that we are meeting all of her needs. So when you look right here, this student was in tier one but the SGP was 25, meaning that we really need to look and make sure that we're supporting this student because while she's in tier one, she might not stay there. This student actually qualified for a speech and language, for speech and language services. Um, so as we were going through this, it was that great reminder to be watching those kids. I also want to point out one of my favorite little stinkers this year at that 92nd percentile, smart as a whip. And this is something for him, the reading part was easy. And he was that kid that, you know, I really had to make my example and you can be the model and wait till I slide and read that word loud and proud because you set a great example. He hated writing because he knew his writing did not look like his reading that he was so proficient with. But even his reading, starting at that 92nd percentile, grew to the 97th percentile and had an SGP of 95. So he grew more than 95% of other students that started in that 92nd percentile. And he's one of those kids that I really view as, I think is the sticking point for some people that they, what about the kids that can already read? But this student was a struggling writer because he, was a perfectionist. He knew it didn't look like he saw it in the book, but he did not have the skills and strategies to spell correctly, so he didn't. Um, I'll go ahead and show the other class of data. And again, you can just see some of the tier movement we saw, those SGPs and what students 
we were looking at how we can increase the intensity or frequency for those students. Is there anything else anyone else wanted to add about the class data before I go on? And I would just say we, we really, <clears throat> ESL, we learned a lot about this year. If we have any people on here, um, hopefully we can get to your questions. But when we looked at that data, even if, they, if um, and, and we can't point any ESL students out on there, but ESL grows at all different times, but it was that data provided us with, yes, but five of our ESL students hit that 50% um, student growth percentile. What you're doing for them is right, but these four, they're below the 50th. We need to look at a different intervention for them. Um, so what is that going to be? So we really, um, that student growth percentile just, it was one additional piece that said, we can't do things the way we've always done. And we've got to differentiate pretty much down to the individual or in small groups to make sure that every single student is targeted to hit their needs while we continue to do this as a tier one all student implementation um, and that was very effective and i will tell you it brought tears to some meetings um, it brought we need to walk away from this for a week until we can get back together um, it was definitely mind shifts but in the end the the data was so much more than there's still a tier three kid um, it really, that, um, if you're not looking at SGPs, what we learned this year is we really need to be um, to, to look at, even in tier one, are all students growing? And in tier three, are they growing? Is what we're doing working? Um, but they're just still a tier three child. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so I, I feel like we've talked a lot about what we did to implement ECRI in the classroom. So uh, just to make sure we have time, I, so this was just our tier one, tier two, tier three, what we did with students. I know um, we did also add in RAVO as a tier three intervention for students. But when we talk about ECRI, it's easy to think that this takes over the entire day. It really was 30 minutes. It was that 20 minute lesson. Um, it was the decodable text reading, which we were able to do during our reading workshop. We were still doing our mini lesson with that workshop approach. There were just these small shifts elsewhere, like the sound spelling wall that we were adding in as a reference during our writing workshop time that we had um, decodable text that students were requesting to keep in their book boxes because they felt successful reading them that they were out able to be practicing reading instead of fake reading that whole time, which was really awesome to see as well. Um, so then we, so we, oh, this was our case study. So I'm just going to stop there for a second. Um, as we we're so excited about our results and we wanted to see how we got at the end of the year and then COVID hit. Um, we were not ready to give up with ECRI. And I will say State College is just a very fortunate district. Um, was able to get things rolling almost immediately. We had spring break, we had a week where we did some planning and then that following week we were starting instruction. And as a team, we knew we wanted to continue with ECRI because of the successes that we had seen with our students and to also provide consistency for our kids to give like a normal part of their day. Um, so as you saw in the video, we recorded our lessons. We broke that up among the teachers so that there was that lesson, the whole group, tier one ECRI with the teacher voice that was giving the responses. Then there was also the decodable text lesson. So there were two separate lessons that the students were able to access. On top of that, Maria Neely, one of our other first grade teachers, and Laurie Corman were meeting with students live in small groups to do the tier two meeting intervention to uh, continue that practice, but after they had done their tier one with watching the lesson. So Laurie, did you wanna speak to um, your live lessons? Um, and part of actually the week that we were planning, I did have parents reach out to me because they had seen the success in their children and they were concerned 
that if they didn't continue with these lessons, um, that they would lose the momentum that they had accomplished. So we, um, I did start three times a week. I met with my um, title kids from mostly from Jamie's room and um, they showed up every day. <laughs> they showed up every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 o'clock. Um, if I was a little late getting on, I had emails, parents asking, are we do? are you there today? Um, the parents were really, have also taken this into their wheelhouse and really have been very supportive of continuing their student, their child's learning with us. And so, um, we it was a little more interesting in small group trying to do it um i started off trying to do it live like you would if you were in class um but some of the students were just not as patient about waiting for the slide so i eventually started just having them take turns and then we would so i carved out at least five to ten minutes for the decodables and the writing because i knew that was kind of where everything comes together for them. And I will have to say, they once we got into the routine, they were very patient. They would wait for everybody to take their turn reading. Um, everybody wanted to still read first, but it was a good also way for me to check in to see which kids are still having um, difficulties with learning some of the um, patterns or some of the words that we're working on. So, uh, but it, Eventually, once we've, I found out what worked for us online, um, live, it did, it was very successful. Um, from what I understand, we have a lot of questions. So we definitely want to use this last 30 minutes to get to some of your questions. Um, while I'm waiting for those to come in, I did want to just show everybody um, quickly the um, website. If you do want to check out our videos, um, you will be able to see this website that we have here that we've created and what we have done with the virtual plan for our families um, and all of these again you will have access to be able to check out so just wanted to point that out too and again while we're waiting for those questions the other thing i thought was important to say is that um, Lori and i actually went through our letters three facilitator training this year which has been a huge um, help and support to really being able to guide discussions with teams and, and, and help it. And we're hoping to continue that training with our, um, our district um, next fall. So some of the questions, I'm just going to kind of read them off. And then Danielle, Jamie, and Lori, if you want to go ahead and pop in and, and jump in on them. Uh, do, they, do they get title kids? Do the title kids get to pre, get, this, get to pre-teach the same day as the classroom lesson or is it the day before? Virtually, I'm not sure, <laughs> but it did seem like um, a couple times the kids would giggle and they're like, Mrs. Corman, we watched that this morning. So then I knew that we were just kind of, I was just kind of going day one, day two, day three, and wherever the parents happened to be in that journey, um, it wasn't as nicely a pre-teach, but during the regular school year when we were in person, it was the for the most part, it was the same day. There were a couple groups um, of tier three students in second grade that got the pre-teach the day before. Um, we did a little bit of shifting of students. Some of my tier two students went to Jamie's room for an ECRI lesson, and then they would, but they would get the pre-teach the day before. Do not let a schedule define you. Our schedule at the beginning of the year um, constantly changed and um, we just found pieces and holes that could work because we were a day ahead with ESL, like Jamie said, and it wasn't working, so we needed to, to regroup. And just working little bits with our staff, we were able to make tweaks, but you just, you have to, when, when you realize the impact that this is making, you have to fight and, and adjust as needed so that you can really see what is the overall best impact. So if it's not working as much as we want, doing it the day before, let's put it to the morning. First grade had to shift to a different time as well. So it's all the cogs working together to make that um, the most effective practice we can make it. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, is the program only for first graders or is this a K to two? Danielle, do you wanna to speak to kind of the plan on that one? I am so excited, um, it, although so sad because um, as, as we said, we have an awesome, awesome school. Um, we also have people that, that are set in their beliefs and, and some are really like, no, um, you know, still have hold that value of, of whole language and the overall student. And when we embraced this in first grade, there were a lot of questions. And what we did is slowly said, come in, watch it, see what you think. And the, the, put, the proof was in the writing that our first graders were writing in many cases better than our second graders. And our second graders teachers in the hallway are like, whoa, this is what we want. Kindergarten jumped on pretty early. As we said, we started slowly with Hagerty, but we realized the, the need for that phonemic awareness. And when we said, this is the phonics piece, that you know, by second grade, you might not even in a few years have to hit on Hagerty except for an intervention. Um, they began to ask questions. They started popping over to rooms and we are set um, this summer to train kindergarten and second. Um, we hope to bring the first grade together with them as kind of coaches along the way. But by, by March, um, all teachers had embraced, let's do this for next year. I mean, I went to them, I went to PLCs and said, you need to understand this is an EP initiative. We're not backing down. If, if you value the whole child and, and aren't willing to try this, I respect that for now. We can look at different grade levels within the building, but they were all like, no, we've seen it. We're willing to give it a try. Again, it took though, it took our title teachers talking about it. It took our first grade teachers talking about it. It took Heather Spots from the IU going into kindergarten and second grade and suggesting things for Hagerty and saying, you know, it kind of looks like this, just so you know. And when they begin to see the results of just the simple Hagerty 10 minutes, uh, they were on board. So we cannot wait for next year um, to really embrace it as a school. Great. Um, next, que uh, next question. Uh, will we have access to the slides? Um, Jamie, maybe we can take, I don't know if there's any reason why we couldn't share that or pare it down at some point. So we will work on getting you that information. I'm also right now putting together a slide with all of our contact information so that you can get in touch with any of us that we'll share here at the very end. Um, screeners, we will talk about the screeners that we're using and then also about the tool that we're using for benchmarking and progress monitoring. So I don't know who wants to take that one, but I'll be glad to jump in if needed. Let me know. I can let Lori take it, but we're, uh, Jonathan may want to share that we are changing next year. Um, so um, go ahead, Lori, and share what we use, but how, what we're moving towards. Um, we do use Ames Web Plus um, this year, and we used, part of the reason I think some of our, um, our nonsense word fluency was kind of goofy, the results were because we didn't give the nonsense word fluency at the very beginning of the year um, because it had been part of Ames Web, but then when they went to Ames Web Plus, they dropped it. And so after learning and starting letters, I realized how important that information was. And so then we tested them, but tested them later. Um, but we used that. And we, this year we did do some, um, we did the past assessment too for phonemic awareness. But we used the um, word reading and the oral reading fluency assessments for the screeners. And then we used, we did end up drilling down. So whatever the kids, what the place at where we were instructing them or is where we um, did the progress monitoring. So some of my kids were in nonsense word fluency. Some of them were in, um, the oral reading fluency it just depended where they scored. Great, and um, through all of the work that we've been doing with Patton, um, we're actually as a district in the process of uh, moving to Acadians as our new benchmarking and progress monitoring tool. So that is something that we're in the process of doing that will be up and ready in the fall. Um, another question. Um, are those scores uh, reading and writing combined? I don't know. I don't think so. No. We don't have a, I mean, we use benchmarking assessments for writing. We don't have, um, so that would have just been the reading from the Ames web that we were looking at. 
Um, another one uh, question about tier three and student growth percentiles. If you see a student that is in tier three is making appropriate growth, would you recommend continuing the tier three because it's working or would you back off to a tier two level of support? Because this was our first year, we kind of kept them in tier three. I was, I was kind of like, okay, if they're, even though they're making enough growth, I really want to see them also closing the gap and being able to, um, because one of our little uh, second graders, she was moving and doing a nice job, but I still wanted to see the results in her second grade oral reading fluency. So we just kept her at the tier three level. Um, she received tier one from Jamie in phonics. She came to me for half an hour for um, a preview, and then I took her for another 20 minutes at the very end of the day for um, just the spots in the ECRI where she was having the most difficult time. But because we had only started in October, I hated to make many movements in the tiers until we have a better grasp of what that looks like, if that makes sense. One of the things we didn't mention is we did have some second graders who were tier three come down every day to the classroom. Um, with a teacher that um, mainly it was with Jamie because they had known her from being in first grade the prior year. But that was another way that we gave them uh, second graders who really needed um, the phonics piece uh, additional interventions and then title kept them and really saw some nice gross growth with them as well. And then I just want to piggyback on what was said because one of the things that I don't know that was explicitly mentioned is while we have a large ESL population, we also have a large population of students that are dual language that do not receive ESL services. So it's a large group of students that English is not their first language, but they are proficient speakers. But we notice in the classroom that we still need to work on the vocabulary piece and some of those students have gaps in their reading and it's been really wonderful for some of those students who aren't getting that extra support um, and i i was not sure i was sold on the decodable text at first and um, i was amazed at how well done they they were but also the power of those decodable text and a story that is not always predictable with vocabulary that we had really rich conversations about among all of my students. So not just my students that were struggling readers, all of my students, we had rich conversations because it's not always natural to have a decodable word when you would predict something else. Danielle, do you wanna, or whoever wants to speak about this, do you maybe wanna talk a little bit about how we're implementing and um, how we've layered into our current program in terms of we're not necessarily using the basal series, but we're able to use its scope and sequence and et cetera, because I think that's really, really important, um, making sure that everyone understands that alignment of the resources in the scope and sequence. I mean, I, I can talk a little bit. Jamie probably has a better handle on it. Again, we, <laughs> we, we went from a full workshop, everybody reads their choice book, we might pull some intervention strategy groups in some cases uh some classes we didn't weren't even doing that um really just down to the individual full workshop um so it was some difficult conversations again from the district level not so much our first grade team um that we really needed these um guided reading and and we looked we helped with the help of patan with the help of heather we looked at some core reading programs that we could just buy the decodable text and not the series. And I, I want, again, I think it is critical to know that these ladies did the decodable text differentiated in small groups according to need. And it was so interesting to see that we had students for the first time that when they were independently reading, they weren't fake reading. Um, they, they were doing their little ecria. In fact, I have some videos of them having their story that was um, for them for the week and they would sit down and independently read and they were doing um, so there's a whole system with the, the decodable and that is how they were reading and they were chunking through books we took our superintendent and assistant soup to see Lori Corman so we picked one of our we said pick a kid and follow him 
and showed that he was reading and he wasn't word reading. He was phrase and sentence reading and he was attacking every single word. And we have not seen, he wasn't guessing. He wasn't, oh, it looks like I'm going to look at this picture for a visual cue. That went away. They still had their book boxes though. So they still had those different books, but we saw kids going to those guided reading books um, because they could read them and they wanted to, to be able to, they felt the power. And Jay, one of Jamie's kids, she will tell you, came from us from a homeless situation. The kids had moved seven different times within one school year and she cried the first day because she said, I don't know how to read. And within a week, she said to Mrs. Ramey, I'm a reader. So that is the power in, you can take decodable texts and really push them into a workshop model. You, you just have to think through. And it may not be perfect, um, but it is, it, it is workable. Some of the um, questions that are, have been coming up about this are speaking directly about the phonics program that we're using and the decodable texts that we're using, where they're from, and um, how that decodable text is done online. I can tell you that you'll definitely be able to see the videos and watch the videos with how the deco decodable texts are working. Um, but to just summarize a little bit more of what Danielle was saying, um, since we weren't, since we don't have a basal program within our school district, we were using uh, Journeys um, scope and sequence and the, the ECRI resources that are aligned to Journeys. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's not the most cohesive when you think about the idea of what ECRI stands for is enhancing core reading instruction. We're kind of using it a little bit differently. However, the scope and sequence and the, the scope and sequence of the ECRI routines and the decodable texts are actually the journeys, um, journeys program. Uh, Lori, can you, did, sorry, does anyone want to uh, add in on that at all? No, that was a question that was coming up. Lori, can you talk a little bit about Hegarty and Ecri and Jamie as well and uh, what that looks like? I think it's important to talk about when we're doing Hegarty, not only just in first grade, but just across the district as well in classrooms. And um, I'll mention this too, a part of Hegarty, as Danielle mentioned earlier, and the lack of phonemic awareness instruction that we were seeing, um, that we allowed our reading specialists and our school teams to really allow that to grow organically. And it wasn't even a full calendar year before almost every one of our classrooms in the primary were using Hegarty's um, resources. So Lori, do you want to pop in and just dive in about that a little bit? Um, we do, we also actually, because we found it to help us be so successful, we also do a lot of previewing of the Hegarty and Title I. Um, I also use Kilpatrick sometimes because it's, it's a little quicker, but I will have to say, this being the second year, I, we can really get through those Hegarty lessons pretty quickly. The kids are becoming really fluent, and so it's not taking teachers very long. Um, I'm sure Jamie will talk more about that. Um, so people are, because they've gotten pretty proficient at it, people are finding their 10 minutes here or there to kind of squeeze it in real quick, whether it's before lunch or um, in between maybe a special and recess or wherever they sometimes have that little chunk of time where they might have done a reading or whatever before they've been um, putting in the Hegarty resource there. So I'm just gonna kind of echo what Laurie said and we, we do the same thing in the classroom. So with that tier two, we had students that we found were really struggling with their phonemic awareness. So they were getting a preview in the classroom, uh, sometimes title one students, but sometimes just students who we found, uh, we use the past assessment that just didn't have strong phonemic awareness. One of the things that as we started the ECRI practices with journeys, there are routines that cover some of those phonemic awareness pieces. So it was really great for the kids, and I'm so excited, excited to start the year with both next year, um, that they really do complement each other well and really build that phonemic awareness. And we were just talking, um, we were in a meeting and Pam Kastner was saying, you know, and it's so quick because now they are phonemically proficient. So it really is getting to that place where this is easy and automatic for the students that they don't have to manipulate. They can just, just like in our keynote, when we were able to read beneficial, our students are able to manipulate these words easily because they've had the practice. Great, thank you. 
Um, I think one of the main reasons, aside from our whole team working together so cohesively, one of the main reasons why we're working so well and so successful is the support that we have from our IU10 and from Patton. And I just wanted to do a quick shout out, and I know she's here because I see her uh, in the room, is Heather Spots, who is our literacy and MTSS consultant from IU10. She has been an absolute um, wonderful addition to our team, and we are really, really thankful for the support that she has been able to give us. And also want to shout out to our patent people, including Dr. Collins and Do uh, Dr. Kastner and, and all of the people that have really been helping um, State College in our, in our journey here. Um, so we're getting a couple other questions too um, in the about 10 minutes that we have left um, talking about our core program and um, our core program I, I guess I'd say is, is not a um, actual program. Our district itself does um, use the Lucy uh, Lucy Calkins phonics and readers and writers workshop model. However, what we had been seeing in um, Easterly, especially with the numbers like Danielle had mentioned earlier, was that we were still had we still had some kids that were really really disengaged uh, from that, given what we know their backgrounds are and experiences. So once we went to the MTSS conference, we thought let's try to put this in there um, and see how that works. And what we're really trying to do is to build the system that best fits our kids' needs. So I don't want to say that we have a boxed program of anything. We're really trying to um, build what's best based on the needs of our kiddos. And there is. Our teachers were in every area, so we have a curriculum. Sorry, there is a curriculum. Um, Lucy is a resource, but our teachers are given uh, leniency that they can use other um, materials, uh, other resources to target the curriculum. And I will tell you that these ladies were continued to, to target all high priority needs within the curriculum. Um, and probably, and Jamie could tell you, began to be able to move a little bit faster because our kids were reading. And that was really the piece that we saw. I mean, again, when we're in this meeting and we're talking about ECRI, it sounds like this huge all-encompassing program and it was a very powerful small part of our day. So um, our students that were getting services, that were getting that tier two support, were going first thing in the morning and getting their preview. Then we had our 20 minute whole group lesson and then we moved into our workshop model. So we were able to do many lessons still with our entire class on comprehension, vocabulary, central theme of books. Like we're still doing that as our reading instruction. But then when we moved into our small groups with that workshop approach, we were able to really target the needs of all of our students. So there were students that when they met with me, we were doing decodable text and we were working through that book and becoming fluent readers. But then I had kids that they flew through that decodable text and we were doing book groups. So while ECRI is like, when we talk about it, it really does, it feels like it takes over your day. It is this small, very powerful lesson that then makes the other parts of your day easier because you have a, a clear path. It is no longer, I need to pull 17 different resources to try and give these students interventions. I know if there's a student not making progress with just tier one, we can give a preview, a tier two light or a full preview of ECRI to help with their reading. I know if that's not working, we need to really look at that tier three. But one of the things that we've really come to notice is that to get the, that model of 80, 15, five, we have to be delivering robust, clear, explicit tier one instruction. And that's what ECRI has really given us. Jamie, you had kind of mentioned this um, briefly, but can you kind of go through again, the time schedule of what that looks like for a kid? And then also consider what the time schedule would look like for a kid who may also be receiving support from a special ed teacher and what amount of time is actually it takes to push in, push out and all of that stuff. So we were very creative. So when Danielle was saying like, don't let the schedule box you in, we luckily have a very flexible team that we really did kind of mess with the schedule and figure things out. So um, for my typical day, the students come in in the morning, uh, as our announcements come on, the kids are eating their breakfast, doing their morning work. I pull a group for a five to 10 minute tier two light. 
We just do half of all of it. It is a quick and dirty. Here's the things that I know you're gonna see today to give them a leg up, but that's only a small group. Um, our tier two title one students that are receiving services are leaving for that 20 minutes, 30 minutes with Laurie Corman to go, or Danielle Bandell, our other title one teacher, and they're doing a full ECRI lesson preview. They come back to the classroom and we do the same thing. We do our full ECRI lesson with the dictation. And then I think all three of the first grade teachers, we went straight into our first round of readers workshop. Uh, we, we are very lucky in State College that we do have paraprofessionals in our room. So in our classrooms, we were able to have our paraprofessional have a small group where she was able to do a Hegarty preview or be working on writing with students. But that's when we really go into that workshop piece where my most struggling readers came straight to me after ECRI to do the decodable reading. And one of the pieces with the alignment of the ECRI with journeys, or journeys with ECRI, I'm sorry, and the decodable is that the words align so well and that the students are exposed to the words and practicing that it became almost a joke. Like the kids were like, hey, we did this in ECRI. I'm like, yeah. Every day, that's what we're doing is we're practicing these words in ECRI. But then the decodable text is putting all of those pieces into practice, that application piece. Um, so after that small group, we came back all together as a whole group and did a reading mini lesson. So that's where we would hit things like our central theme, uh, point of view, where we're still talking about those bigger pictures picture ideas with reading. And that's where as a team, we did pull from like our Lucy Calkins reading or Jennifer Saravello's reading strategies that we would do many lessons based on that. And then we would go back into our small groups for two more rounds where I would be meeting with students, our paraprofessionals would be meeting with students, and then we'd have students working independently. Um, after that, we'd take a little break and then we had our writing time where we would do a writing mini lesson and then we would go into our writer's workshop time. And that piece was not changed by ECRI except for as teachers, we did put up our sound spelling cards and had that as a reference for our students that we were able to link with that writing piece. You know, oh yeah, that's E like our feet card and then we can look with the students and give them a really specific spelling number two on that card. So it really did give a great resource for that spelling piece, but we were still teaching a writing mini lesson based on, you know, beginning, middle, end, uh, the mechanics of writing and things like that. Do you want me to go into the rest of the day or was that enough with just, with just ELA? I think that's probably good with where we are and it, um, we're kind of running to that point. And what I think that we're going to do is stop taking questions for now and have anyone, if you have uh, additional questions, either reach out to your patent consultants. But in the meantime, I can also put up our contact information. So if you wanted to reach out to any specifically us, you're welcome to do that. And I will work with Kristen to get all of the, um, to get all of the uh, resources and et cetera up on the um, Schoology page to answer those pieces. So um, I, sorry, go ahead, Kristen. No, I was just gonna say, so if you leave that there, I'll do my little um, closing of the session piece and people can write down information or take a screenshot for what they'd like. Um, and as I, I, I was telling Jonathan that I will also send all the questions that came in the chat box to you just so that you guys know what those are. Um, and we'll figure that out from there. Okay, so I just wanna um, say a great big, huge thank you to Easterly Parkway Elementary. You guys did a fabulous job. And um, thank you to all, everyone who is here as a participant um, for attending. Um, this session was recorded, so it will be available on the Patent YouTube channel in the near future. And, um, the patent literacy team will also be providing um, supports that are aligned to each presentation that will help maximize learning for teachers and for um, families.